All right, so just a little bit of recap from last week in chapter 45. Of course, um, Joseph broke down and, and let everybody know who he was, that he was actually their brother Joseph. You know, his brothers had all come down and um, he, he finally stopped playing that, that he wasn't their brother and pretending to be um, just that, the, the man in charge. But he revealed unto them that he's their brother and, um, you know, they, they all talk and hug each other and it's a real emotional event and then he decides he's going to send them back to to get all of this so he's like well you guys all need to come and move here and pharaoh heard about it and he said you know he sent them with these wagons to help them to transport them and all their goods and all their family and everything that they have into egypt because joseph told me he's like look there's five more years of this famine you know this is just year two so this is going to be going on for a while. You guys, it's better for you just to come into Egypt. We'll take care of you. You know, no big deal. And, and Pharaoh is all excited that Joseph's family, his brethren, you know, that they were all going to come down to Egypt. So he was being hospitable to them and, and telling them to come down, sent them with those wagons. Because, you know, back then, uh, you know, how, how are you going to travel? They're going to be going on foot or maybe on like a horseback or camel or something to that effect or an ass. But the wagons help out a lot. And I'm sure not everybody had a wagon. And Pharaoh's like, here you go. You know, he kind of is taking care of them so that they can, they can do what they, they need to do in order to get down. And Israel was an old man also at this point. And, um, and so that's what happened. That's where, where chapter 45 ends is, is his sons telling Israel, saying, you know, Joseph's still alive. And at first he doesn't believe him. And then he sees all the stuff coming that, that he sent with to, to help them bring their stuff back and all the food and everything else. And, and he was convinced, and he's like, yeah, Joseph's alive. And, and um, so here we are in chapter 46. You know, look down at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. Now, um, it's interesting. It's, you know, We've got to remember not to forget all the things that have happened with Israel in his life. You know, God has been leading him and directing him all throughout his life. You remember when he was sent away. Now, obviously, he, he, he was doing some shady things with his brother when he, when he went in and he stole the blessing and you know, he was being real deceitful. But then his, his uh, parents sent him away to go find a wife because um, you know, Rebecca didn't want him to, to be killed. So she sent, she, she was talked to her husband. He's like, you know, send him away to go find a wife, uh, not one of these heathen wives. So as they send him away, remember he goes and, and at Bethel, he, he builds that, that pillar unto God. He sees the angels of God ascending and descending. And, and he says, you know, God, if you're going to be with me, I'll, you'll be my God and I'll give you the tenth of all my increase and all that stuff. And then he goes into the promise. And God leads him and directs him through the whole thing. You know, he goes through hard times. He gets his wages changed by Laban. He's working for him. And God's with him. And God stays with him the whole time. He ends up blessing him. He comes back out of, um, out of Paden Aram and goes back into the land of Canaan. And then when he comes back, he again is offering up his sacrifices and he, and he goes back to these holy places where he's, he's built an altar unto God and, and, he, and he makes his sacrifice. So now here, and it's, it's like every time he's making a journey, he's doing that. You know, he's, he's, he's bringing his, his offerings unto the Lord before he goes and makes this big journey. So now, once again, we see him making his, his journey into Egypt, leaving the land of Canaan and going down and um, he makes his another sacrifice in Beersheba on his way down. Look at verse number two. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Now, if you remember, I just want to point this out real quick because I preached on Sunday morning about how God has delivered his word unto us. And of course, I went over the King James Bible and how it's preserved. And actually, this is going to come into play in this chapter specifically. And I know Brother Joseph knows exactly what I'm talking about because we were talking about this chapter before church tonight. And um, this, is, this is all real interesting the way this plays together. First of all, I just want to point out here in verse 2, it says, you know, God spake unto Israel. Israel audibly heard God's voice, but how did he do it? Well, in this instance, it says, in the visions of the night. So he probably either had a dream where God was in it or he had some kind of a vision, but it was, you know, it was at nighttime and um, he heard God's voice and said, Jacob, Jacob. So God is like literally calling unto Israel. He said, Jacob, Jacob. And he answers and said, here am I. And you remember in Hebrews, it says, you know, God who in times past and in, you know, in, um, 
in diverse manners, you know, spake unto our fathers, as he hath in his last day spoken us by his son. God revealed his word unto the prophets, unto the fathers, you know, in different ways, in diverse manners. And um, in this instance, he was speaking to Jacob audibly, but it was, it was through a night vision. And, um, and I just wanted to point that out since I just preached on that on Sunday morning. This is one of those examples. And this is literally God speaking to Jacob. Now, I don't believe that God do, does this anymore. I believe God has revealed his word in totality. It's complete. He's completed what he has for us to know about him and his words that, that there's no more extra revelation. So when you see people these days that are saying, oh yeah, I got this word from the Lord and, and I hear God talking to me and all this other stuff. That's not God speaking. But here we see Jacob did receive God's word. Verse number three says, and he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt for I will there make of thee a great nation. Now, He's telling, you know, he's putting you know, Israel at ease. He's putting Jacob at ease saying, don't worry about it. You can go into Egypt. Because he's followed what the Lord has told him to do. When the Lord told him to, to leave everything and to go, and, we, when, and the Lord told him to leave Laban and it was time for him to get out of that situation, he did. He went back. He went back to the land of his fathers. He went back to the land of Canaan. You know, he, he's always been obeying what God has, has been telling him what to do. So here we see even more affirmation in Jacob's life from God saying, yes. Don't fear, I want you to go down into Egypt. Um, and he said, there I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. Wait, I'm, hold on a second. <laughs> I've skipped down in my notes. He says, I will there make of thee a great nation. Now, this is a fulfillment. Turn, if you would, back, keep your finger in Genesis 46 and flip back to Genesis chapter 12 because what we're seeing here is a fulfillment of God's promise. It's actually not, not quite the fulfillment yet, but it's a confirmation. He's confirming the promise that was made unto Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Because here we see God promising him, you go down into Egypt, don't fear, because that is the place. That is where I will make a, make, uh, a great nation, make thee a great nation. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And this is when, when Abram had to take God's word by faith and just, okay, God, I'm just going to listen to whatever you do. Verse number, whatever you say that I need to do. Verse number two, and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he gives them this great promise, this great blessing. He says, hey, you leave here and I'm going to make of thee a great nation. He says, I'm going to bless thee and I'm going to make you, thy name great. Now, at this point, is it a great nation? No. I mean, you have Israel and his family. Now, they're starting to grow, right? Um, Israel had, had his 12 children. And they're, you know, in number, they, they're about 70 people, right? The 70 descendants of Israel at this point in time. And this is now where God's saying, okay, that promise that he made unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and then finally unto Jacob, right? This is the same promise that's, that, that he's continuing to, to reinforce. He confirms it again as Jacob's going down to Israel, into Egypt because that is the place where they're going to multiply and they're going to abound and they're going to become this great nation is in the land of Egypt. And that was all explained unto Abraham also. He said, look, you're going to go and sojourn. You're going to temporarily stay in this strange land. I'm going to show you this is the land you're going to inherit. You're going to get all of this land, but there's going to come a time you're going to be brought into bondage. You're going to be taken away. You're going to be brought into bondage. Your people, you know, your descendants, you're going to be evil and treated 400 years and then I'm going to come and deliver you because of the wickedness of the, land, of the people that are going to enslave you. And, and he explains all of that to him. And, um, but here, so Genesis chapter 12 was that promise. Now, the children of Israel were in Egypt for 430 years and this is the starting point. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 explains this. There's a lot of, there's references, these events that, that are happening now that we're going through in Genesis chapter 46 
are referenced in the New, the New Testament and other places in the Old Testament as well. This is a very significant, a lot of significant events are happening here. So I don't want to gloss over them too quickly. And there's a lot of people also who get the dates wrong on these types of things. And you have to be very careful when you read. And, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But, but any time you read the Bible, there are lots of people who want to claim there's mistakes in the Bible and that there's scribal errors. And this ties in perfectly with what I was preaching on Sunday morning about God's word. Like, you know, we believe it's inerrant. There are no errors in this book. We believe, the reason why we believe it is because God has preserved his word for us. It wasn't just left up to the, the man to do it. If, if God didn't have his hand in the preservation then man probably would screw it up. But we know that God has already promised to preserve his word. And here's a, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of little things like this, and they're real neat. And when you, when you start to look at them, it actually makes a lot of sense. Don't, don't ever let the naysayers confuse you or, or make your faith to, to drop in, in the Bible or in God's word or in his preservation over certain issues that they'll bring up. And... There's a lot of people that will that'll give you the wrong amount of time that the children of Israel were even in Egypt. They'll say it's only like 200 years as opposed to 430 years, which is what we're going to see. Look, at, look if you would at Galatians 3. Look at verse number 16. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And we were just looking at those promises. Right? The promise of them inheriting the land and making him a great nation. Uh, verse, uh, continue reading, he says, He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Look at verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promises of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here we see this reference to the 430 years after. What's he saying? He's saying the law, the Mosaic law, came 430 years after. After what? Well, it came after, it says, let's read from the beginning again in verse 17. And this I say that the covenant, not the covenant when it was given to Abraham, because this is where people fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, well, the covenant was given to Abraham, you know, well before um, they even went into Egypt, right? So they start the time at the time that, that God promised Abraham this promise and say that was 430 years after the law. But he says, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. It was confirmed right here in this moment that we're in in Genesis chapter 46, when God makes that promise unto Jacob, he confirms the same exact promise he made unto Abraham. Now it's confirmed of saying, I will make of thee, or he says, yeah, and, and I will there make of thee a great nation, talking about in Egypt. He confirms the promise that was given unto Abraham, it was given unto Isaac, and then given unto Jacob. And here it's confirmed that yes, this is going to happen. I will bless thee and make you a great nation. That, that covenant here. And that was 430 years after. And here's why. And one more piece of evidence. You say, well, that is not really enough to convince me. I still, you know, it still seems like it could be when Abraham was made, the, you know, was given that promise. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12. Because this day that we're reading about here, when they actually go into Egypt, is a very, very significant day. Exodus chapter 12. There's more evidence for the, the exact 430 years of the children of Israel being in, existing in, living and dwelling in the, the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, look at verse number 39. Verse number 39 reads, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now, this is talking about like they're preparing the Passover, right? This is, I mean, they're, they're on the run. They're, you know, they're like, they had to get out of Egypt. Verse number 40 says, um, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. So there again, we see a very clear statement. Of course, Exodus, we're in Exodus 12. Exodus is their Exodus out of Egypt. It, it chronicles that whole 
the whole um, story of them, you know, Moses going on to Pharaoh, let my people go, and all the plagues, and then him sending them out, and, and all of that happens. And um, here we see this statement in verse 40, the sojourning, it means, you know, they were, they were staying there temporarily, the sojourning while they were living there, the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Look at verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. That is, that is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. So it said 430 years even to the exact day. So the very, the very exact day that they arrive in Egypt and they get into Egypt, they're there for exactly 430 years when they're finally kicked out. And I don't know, honestly, like, there, I don't know all the significance regarding that, but there's got to be something, you know, God doesn't do things by mistake or by accident or coincidence. And to say that this, this was there, for like, all the way to the exact day, there's, there's probably more meaning to that. And that's something that, that I'm interested in. I'm going to look into a little bit more. Unfortunately, I don't have that for tonight to be able to go into that in much detail. But, um... I think it's real interesting in the fact that they're coming in and they're marking it from this day and they're staying in Egypt for those 430 years. You know, don't, don't, make, don't let the reading in Galatians 3 let you think that there's a contradiction because what people will do is think that this is referring to when Abraham was made the promise, but the key verse was it was confirmed. It's when was it actually confirmed? It was confirmed to Israel. It was confirmed to him that that promise is going to, to happen. Because it was after that than it, than it actually did. And there's no more confirmation after that. They just start multiplying. There's no more of God speaking and saying, yeah, I'm going to... Because he, he did that multiple times. He, he reinforced that promise to, to um, Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And then this is the last confirmation of that and they come into Egypt. But uh, flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 46. So we were in verse 3, where it says, uh, you know, he's telling them, fear not to go in Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And that's like that final confirmation of the, of the promise that was made unto Abraham. Verse 4, I will go down with thee into Egypt. So he's saying, I'm going to be with you. You have nothing to be afraid of. And, you know, God has made this promise unto Jacob multiple times in his life, saying, don't fear, I am with you. And, we, you know, it's always been uplifting and, and um, edifying to, to read these stories about Jacob and him going and making these great journeys and doing these things. And now he's an old man and he has to go make, you know, move all, pick up and move all of his stuff and travel all the way into the land of Egypt. And, um, you know, God's saying, you have nothing to worry about because I'm with you. And any time you're in God's will and you're doing what we want to do, you have nothing to be afraid of. No matter what the outside, no, no matter what famine is going on around you, no matter if there's like an economic collapse. I mean, think about this. This famine is like an economic collapse. And that's literally what happens because we'll see the money fails in the land of Egypt. The money is just, just becomes completely useless. It's good for nothing. Because Pharaoh gets it, get, you know, Joseph eats it all up from the people and then there's just money's no longer good anymore. It has no value. And, um, you know, if we are making sure that we're staying in God's will, hey, we live in a world today that uses a meaningless currency already as it is. This fiat money that we have, the, this, this, this pieces of paper that are backed by absolutely nothing is, is really valuable. It only, it's only going to hold that value as long as other people can still see some kind of value in that, in that greenback, in that piece of paper that you have. But as soon as, as, soon as you know, <laughs> as soon as people stop buying up our debt, as soon as China stops buying up our debt and no one's there to, to supply our, our credit demand, then the country is going to go bankrupt. And that's a fact. I mean, there's no getting around that. We, we've, we've gone on as far as we have in this country just, just based on our old reputation of being good for, th you know, of just, just being good for it and, and, and being the, the world leader and stuff, but that's slipping. And people are starting to see through the facade and starting to get a little bit more educated and understand this is just one big deck, of, one big house of cards. 
and it's going to get knocked over quickly when, when you realize that you know the gold that we're supposed to have to back all this stuff up isn't there and that all of this debt that we have is, is going to be unpayable completely unpayable no one no one's going to want no country's going to want to buy up our debt because they say well great we're getting interest on this you're going to keep on paying us back because at one point at some point it's going to be like well we can't pay you back because we've just borrowed too much it's it's like running up your credit card to the let's say you have like a like a for some reason they give you like a couple hundred thousand dollar limit and you're making twenty thousand dollars a year right so you run it up to to ten times what you even can earn in one year and you still have to be able to eat and, and, and survive off of some of the money that you make. So, you know, at some point they're going to be like, look, we can't give you any more money because we're never going to see that. It's impossible for you to pay us back. And that's where the situation in the United States is in right now. It's never going to happen. We're never going to be able to pay this stuff back. So the reason why I'm bringing all this stuff up is because an economic collapse in this country is, is very, very likely it's not just possible, it's very likely, and it's likely to happen in, in a relatively short term. I mean, 10 years, 20 years, who knows? I don't know, five years, two years even. No, I, mean, I can't predict the future in that, in that sense, but it's bound to happen. It's gonna, it has to happen. We've gone beyond, as a country, beyond the, 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 point, you know, the, the point of no return when it comes to the, the spending and, the, and this fiat currency. These things can happen, but, but here's why we don't have to worry about that. It's because if we are in God's will, and if we're doing what's right, and if we seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, we don't have to worry about us being fed and us being clothed. God has already promised to take care of that. And God will be with us every step of the way, and he can sustain us. He sustained Israel and all of his family. Remember last week we saw that that's, that's the reason why Joseph probably went through all the stuff that he did. He says, look, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. God had a plan. God worked it out so that you will all be taken care of. You will all be fed. You are God's people. And, and the, the symbolism for us today is we are God's people if you're born again. And God will be looking out for you and can plan it out so that you are taken care of. You, have no, you may not have any idea how it's going to happen. These people, you know, they didn't even know that Joseph was alive. The famine gets started. So they have a little bit of goods and they're starting to spend their goods. If Joseph wasn't around, they would have gone broke just like everybody else before the end of the seven-year famine. And they would have been begging bread. But the Bible says that, you know, I've been, old, I've been young and now I'm old. And, I've yet to, you know, and I have yet to see God's... Oh man, I'm butchering that verse. I've People, I've not seen the righteous begging bread. Thank you. Yeah, that's and that's. And I just quoted that a couple weeks ago. But um, we don't have to worry about begging bread, even though you can see. And that's why I try not to get too caught up in all the politics and all the things that are going on. Now, look, I'm against those things. I think people need to be educated about them. I think it's important to know about it and and be aware of it and understand what's going on. But my big fight and my battle isn't against the Federal Reserve. I'm against it. I'm, hey, people want to fight with it. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm glad for that. And, and maybe I'll even give a little bit of money for a cause like that. But that's not how I'm going to be spending my time because I think it's way more important to get people ready for God to take care of. Get you right with God. Get people saved. Get you, you know, doing the right thing and walking in, in the steps that God has laid out for you and God will protect you too. The collapse is going to come no matter what. I know, I know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. But if we're in God's will, we can, you know, you think of um, Elijah. He, God had, you know, when, when, the, when he prayed that it wouldn't rain on the earth for the span of three years and it didn't rain. And this drought came and this famine and, and, and you know, there's no food. And he went into hiding and God sustained him. He had the ravens bringing him bread and he was by a little brook. And when that brook of water dried up, Guess what? God took him and put him somewhere else and, and miraculously fed him in, in the widow's house with a, with a cruise of oil and a barrel of meal that never failed. I mean, she had a limited supply of food, a very, very small amount. It was almost gone. It got to the point to where it was like the last meal. And somehow that last meal continued day after day after day after day after day after day. It just, oh, we're on, our last, we're on the last one again. God took care of him. 
And God can, can take care of us also, but we just need to make sure that we're, we're in his will, that we're doing what he wants us to do, and that we're not, we're not requiring his, his discipline and his chastisement, because when we get to that point, then he will allow us to go through a lot more <laughs> hard times. And, and um, you know, that's why the, the Bible says that you know, the righteous begging bread. You know, I haven't seen the righteous begging bread, because you're righteous, because you're doing what's right, because you're doing what God has laid out in your, in your life to do. So... God comforts Jacob. He tells him, look, I'm going to be with you and, uh, and you're going to see Joseph. And um, verse 5 says, And Jacob rose up from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. He picked up and moved everything. Nobody got left behind. Everybody gets moved and transported into Egypt. Now, um, verse 8 says, And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. And now it's going to start listing all of the names of his sons and of their children. So it says Reuben, you know, Hanak, Valerie, and I'm not going to read all of the names. But what's real interesting, and I noticed, is I hadn't ever noticed this before, but normally when I start studying for, for, the, for the Wednesday night Bible study, sometimes I'll, 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 I'll typically do this. I'll, I'll look at certain things, and, I, and especially with the things with numbers, and, and the names and genealogies. I like comparing the genealogies and seeing if there's some... Because when you start doing these studies and, and really starting to break it down and take it apart and see, well, what can I learn? I'm always interested, what can I learn by this? You know, the, the book of like First Chronicles and you start going through the chapters, it could, be, it could seem real boring. And it is if you're not really thinking about it. If you're, if you're looking at Bible reading as just a chore, then it could be real boring. I mean, there's no action going on. But see, these types of things I love studying because it's in there for, a re everything is in there for a reason. Why, you know, why is he saying all this stuff? So I like to try to dissect it and pull it apart. And I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I have what I think this means, but I am not 100% sold on it. Now, I don't normally make it a habit to teach things that I'm just not completely, you know, Found it, found it on and grounded and say, yes, I know this is the truth. But the reason why I bring it up is because, for one, I think it's important um, to know that I'm going to be honest with you and, 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 and I'm going to sh show you something that is seemingly a problem. Now, I don't think it is because I've seen little issues like this in the past. I've seen them and then I've seen them answered. Sometimes it's taken a while to get the, the a legitimate, a good answer. I have never not gotten an answer when I've seen one of these things. And this is one of those things that, that, you know, I don't want it to shake your faith in the Bible of whether or not this is right or true or anything like that, because I don't think it's, and I don't think it's that, that big of a deal either. But it's kind of interesting. So here's, enough of that being said, what, what happened here, if you actually count up the names, so what he does is he lists all of the children and grandchildren at that time based on who the mother was. So he starts off lift, listing all the children that Leah had and then grandchildren if they had any, right? And then he's going to go and do the handmaid of Leah and list her children. And then he's going to list Rachel's children, you know, Benjamin and Joseph, and their children. And then it's going to list the other handmaid, okay? So that's the, the, the way that he's, he's going through this and... Um, and giving the, um, or maybe I might have the handmaid switched, but, but regardless, that's inconsequential. What he does then at the end of those lists of names gives a subtotal. These were all of the, you know, so the, the number of souls, this is how many children there were. And in the very first group, it says in verse 15, these be the sons of Leah. So it named off all the names, which she bare unto Jacob and paid in Aram, with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were 30 and 3. Now, if you add up all of the names of the sons and the daughters that are listed here, specifically listed here, you're going to come up with 34. 
Now Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. So if you subtract those two names off, then you're stuck with 32. But this is saying that there was 33. Now the rest of the groups, you start reading the rest of these other names. It says, um, verse 18, these are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even 16 souls. There's 16. It matches up perfectly. You read the next one. It talks about there was 14 souls in verse 22. Those match up perfectly. And then if you read in verse 26, um, all the soul, or excuse me, in uh, verse 25, these are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel's daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. Okay? So you've got 33, you've got 16, you've got 14, and you have seven. And all of those add up to 70. Okay? The only one that has any type of an issue is the first group in Leah's, in Leah's section of, of, of children. Because, like I said, when you add them up, you get 32 instead of 33. And because the reason why we're not including Ur and Onan is because they already died. And the purpose of this in the chapter is trying to explain that, um, you know, how many people were of Israel that went into Egypt, if that makes sense. So like, like we're, we're getting an idea of this is where the starting point is with Egypt. It's 70 people, you know, right when they get into Egypt, essentially. And then because they're going to grow into millions by the time they're, they're getting kicked out of Egypt, they grow into this great multitude. And that's ultimately the point of this. But nothing is, is done for no reason. So what I have, the, the reconciliation I have is this. Let's, let's jump down to verse number um, 26. The Bible reads, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were three score and six. Now, a score is 20. So three score and six is 66. Okay? So you say, well, wait a minute. I thought they all added up to 70. Well, what does it say? It says, all the souls that came with Jacob. You have to remember, Joseph did not come with Jacob. And the two sons of Joseph he had in Egypt because he was given the wife of, uh, the, you know, the, the, the daughter of, of On, the, the priest. So he had a wife and had children in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh were already in Egypt. They didn't come with Jacob. So this, 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 this verse that talks about all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt was 66. And he's saying that they came of his loins, so they're physically his descendants. So it's not including any wives. He's, and and, and it explicitly says that too. He says, um, um, Besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. So his descendants were, were 66. So you say, okay, well, wait a minute. 70, we had a 70 number, minus Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. That's only three people. That's 67. So now we have this one, this one person that is... is not part of, you know, this three score and six. Also, the 33, it's, well, it's only 32. So what is that one, why is there this one discrepancy? And the only answer that I've found that, that is somewhat reasonable is Jacob himself being included in, in the number. So like when you look at this whole list of all the descendants, look at verse eight again. It says, and these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. And then it starts off saying Jacob and his sons. So like Jacob is included in this list of names, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. And then it goes on and continues listing the names. So what he's doing is having himself included in this first group of 33 people. And then everybody else, because Jacob also went into Egypt, right? But when you look at the, so that would be one way of looking at this, of saying, okay, well, that's where that extra person comes from. That's how, that's how you get to 33, 
is including Jacob in that. Now, I'm not 100% sold on this, and that's why I want to point out, because uh, there's something just doesn't quite sit perfectly right with me. But to me, that's, it's good enough to, to say, yeah, it could be that. And I just might not be, you know, my mind's not getting wrapped around it properly. But um, the reason then why that also works for the 66 is because you know, he didn't come with himself. Like, like, you know, these are souls that came with Jacob. So Jacob isn't going to be included in that number either because it's the people that came with him, not himself. He didn't, he didn't come with himself, right? So, <laughs> so there's, there's the 70 minus the 4, which is 66. And that's where we get this. But, you know, you can find these little things in the Bible, and I think they're great. And I think there's, I always, I know that there's always like some extra hidden truth there. There's, there's some reason for this. What, but the, the, the key is finding it out and, and digging in and being willing to just go through. And, you know, I started looking up. I tried to find every reference to all of Leah's children. I said, well, maybe there's a, there's a child that went with them that, that's not listed here and, you know, all this other stuff. And these are fun exercises. These are good things. And hopefully you love the Bible enough and want to just kind of know these things to be able to invest the time to figure these things out. And I'll, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again, probably one of the worst things to do is just go straight to the internet to find the answer because almost, I mean, anytime I have gone to the internet with these things, you find the craziest answers. When we were talking about this earlier, we, we actually looked them up. And some, I mean, some of those, were they just ridiculous? I mean, some of them were just so stupid because most of the commentaries that you'll find out there and people who are publishing things, you know, about, about the Bible and, and about these problems are coming from people who don't even believe that, that the Bible is, like, preserved. Most people, oh, this is a scribal error. Oh, there's a problem here. Or they'll just come up with just any random thing. It's like, well, wait a minute, how, how can you even say that, like, it, it, you know, people just, just come up with the imagination of their heart. It's, oh, well, maybe it's just this. Just, well, may, maybe it's just, uh, I don't even remember what some of the examples were, but they just, they just come up with something, like, out of nowhere. Like, one of them was, well, maybe, maybe uh, Joseph's wife was really a daughter of Leah. It's like, no, it, it, it says that she was a daughter of An. Like, I, I don't buy that for a second. But, I mean, these are just all the different things that they come up with to try to reconcile these errors. But, and that's why I say, you know, a lot of times that can just lead you the wrong way of thinking instead of just praying to God and ask him to, to kind of open up and say, what, you know, what does this really mean, God? I'm having a hard time understanding this. Um, and usually what happens, too, is that you'll find it somewhere else. It's not necessarily going to be in this direct context. So, like, in Genesis chapter 46, you might not be able to find the exact answer. But we do know that it was 70 people that, that, that is, you know, is kind of the starting point in Egypt because that is, is, is also um, given in Exodus chapter 1. That number is, is sure, it's 70 people. Exodus chapter 1 verse 5 says, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already, and Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now, just briefly, I touch on this, this, this concept of being multiplied. We see all throughout Genesis, it's a blessing of God. To be multiplied, to have a group, to be made a great nation of. I mean, this is a promise that was made to Abraham. Look, I'm going to make you a great nation. You will have a lot of descendants, and you're going to be mighty and powerful and strong and doing the right thing. You know, all these these great things. And they, and you know, Rebecca was blessed of being the you know thou should, you know being the mother of 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 um, thousands of thousands. You know, thousand thousand. Of like millions, right? I mean, that's what she was blessed with. That was, that was a good thing. It was a good concept. For the, for the people of God, it was a good thing to have a big family. It was a good thing to, to, to have a lot of descendants. But Christianity today has taken that and warped it and perverted it into, into the world's way of thinking, like China, who has their one world or one person, one child policy, which now I guess they've, they've increased to two, they've doubled it. So now they have a two child policy. 
Maybe they're, they're going down the tubes too quickly. I don't know. Their, their generations are getting too old and there's no young people to help provide for them because they've had this one child policy in effect for so long and now their they're elderly are just going to die and no one's going to be able to take care of them because there's nobody to take care of them. But, um, you know, it's, it's sad. You know, you expect that in a communist country. You expect that in a country that rejects God. But that shouldn't be the case in a Christian country, in a Christian society, in a Christian culture, in Christian churches, where people are saying, yep, I've got a boy and a girl and I'm done. I've got my two kids and that's it. Without realizing the blessing that come from God, that, that children are an heritage of the Lord, that they are a blessing, that, that you know, blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them, referring to children of the youth. We, ought, we, we need to have the right mindset on having family. I mean, these days, people with large families go out and they get looks, they get comments. You know, my wife goes out with our kids. And look, my kids are well-behaved. They're not just running around being little terrors and throwing fits on the floor and screaming. I mean, we get compliments about them all the time. But I'll tell you what, the people that make the comments, it's just completely rude. And it's worse when a Christian makes the comments. Like, well, aren't you guys done yet? What, are you going to have more? Don't you think you've had enough? Hey, do you know what makes those things? All the rude, nasty comments of people who look at children as a burden as opposed to a blessing. And shame on the Christians that have that same mentality. Shame on the Christians that don't have the faith in God to say, you know what? I don't know how I'm going to pay for all the kids, but God's going to be there for me. I, don't, I know I'm not going to have to rely on government assistance to pay for my children because I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I know that they're a blessing. I'm, I'm going to work hard the way God told me to as a man to provide for my family. And, and I'm going to do according to his will. And I'm going to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And I don't have to worry about the food. God will provide that for me. I don't have to be, be scared and fearful in a worldly mindset of just thinking about money. I'm going to let my, my, the natural things happen that should be happening with a husband and a wife. The relationship that goes along with that, we're not going to change that relationship. It's a great thing. It's a, it's a great blessing of God to even have that relationship with a wife, with a, you know, with a husband, with a wife. And we're not going to try to put ourselves in God's place in determining how many children we're going to have. God is the one who opens the womb. God's the one who closes the womb. If God thinks that we shouldn't have any more children, guess what? He won't give us one. He won't create that life. But if God thinks that we could have it and he's going to bless us with one, then praise the Lord. But we are not going to change that and, and do any steps to, to change what God has already decided to do for us. We need, we, you know, all Christians need to have that type of faith. And look, this was a great blessing to have the children of Israel abounding and becoming more. And, and think about that as a Christian. I mean, don't you want to evangelize the whole world? Don't you want everybody to know about Jesus Christ? How better can you do that than having a big family? I mean, who do you have the most influence over out of everybody you know is going to be your own children? You get to teach them. You get to train them. You get to make them, help make them into a better Christian than you are. Invest the time in them. And if you have a whole bunch of them, hey, great, I want to have, you know, right now we've got four. We have four little soul winners. They can do way more than I can ever do in my lifetime if they're taught and they're trained right. And if, if, if more Christians were having big families, think about that. I mean, that's, that's the only reason why the Mormons are as big as they are because they believe in having big families. And their Mormon church has grown so much. I don't think they're really recruiting that many people from, you know, evangelizing people outside of the Mormon faith. They're just having these big families. There's a lot of inbreeding going on, and that's obvious. You could always spot a Mormon <laughs> just based on their facial structure. It's, like, it, it's weird. But, um, but they're, they're growing, and they're, they're building their churches, and they're building their temples, and they're continuing to grow. Why? Because they're having big families. Now, that's a false, wicked doctrine but uh, of religion. But the Christians need to be thinking about it in the same way. I mean, hey, we need to be having more children. We need to be growing. We need to be multiplying. God said, be fruitful and multiply. That was a command and a blessing. I mean, it's a blessing to multiply. It's a blessing to be fruitful and, and, and to receive that fruit. And, you know, anyone who doesn't have kids, it might be a little bit harder to understand. But I love my children. And, and I, I mean, I, I always want to have more. Usually you hear, like, the women always want to have more. Like, I want to have more children. I realize that they're a great blessing from God. And I couldn't imagine my life without any one of my children. 
And I pray that God gives us more. And we ought, we ought to have that faith to just know that, look, God's going to take care of us and understand biblically that you're not being, you know, because what, what people think is that, oh, well, you're not being prudent. You're not being wise. You're not being a good steward and, and you know, determining how many kids you're going to have and, and only, you know, making sure, well, how are your kids going to go to college? How are your kids going to, you know, look, look, my kids aren't going to college, first of all. <laughs> They're not. I, I, don't, I don't care. They're not, they're not going to the state you know, indoctrination center to, to get the, the liberal professors telling them that there is no God and get that pumped into their minds and, and try to shake their faith in God. It's just not going to happen. Oh, but your kids are going to be ignorant. No, they're not. You don't have to go to university in order to be educated, in order to be smart. You can get all, and I, I'm all for knowledge. I'm all for wisdom. I'm all for education but not the indoctrination from this godless world. I don't need to have a college fund in order to say, well, I can't have a kid because I can't afford to pay for their college. What a ridiculous thing to say. You don't even know if there's going to be colleges in 20 years. I mean, there probably will be, but you don't know what they're going to cause. You don't know anything about the situation. You don't know what's going to happen 20 years from now. Why don't you just trust God and rely on, and rely on Him and, and have the children instead of trying to, to meddle with your wicked inventions of things that, that are completely against the way God designed things to be. God designed things away for a reason. We should just, just let it be the way that He created it. But um, let's finish up this chapter here. So that's, that's where I think, you know, with the, with the number, the 66 versus the 70, it's, it's reasonable to think that Jacob is included in the numbering. I'm not 100% sold on that, but I, I wanted to introduce that to you and I wanted to point it out to you. You know, I'm not trying to hide anything from Scripture, but I also don't like to just bring things up without having a decent explanation for it. I think that one's okay, but um, you know, maybe just take that as a challenge. And anyone, if anyone's listening online, if there's anyone listening to this sermon later on, hey, Take this as a challenge. I, I'm interested to hear an alternative to, 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 that, to that solution to this problem. Because there, there is a little bit of a problem here. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But I'm not worried because I know that God has preserved His Word. It's been proven over and over and over and over and over again so many times that I don't even worry about it or even think about it anymore that, oh, well, maybe there's a mistake. No, anytime you think there's a mistake, you are not understanding something. Bottom line. There's just something that you don't get that, 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 that you're missing that you don't understand because you don't know the Bible well enough. And I'm, and I'm willing to admit that, yeah, you know what, there's things that I don't understand because I don't know the Bible well enough, but I don't know anybody who knows everything about the Bible besides Jesus Christ. So um, let's finish off this chapter. He lists off all the names, and it's 60 or 70 people ultimately that go in. Verse number um, 28, and he sent... Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. So, so Israel, of course, is extremely happy to see his favorite son, Joseph. He's still alive. And now he's basically saying, like, now I can die. I'm so happy. I'm so glad to be able to see your face. I can go to the grave in peace, is essentially what he's saying here. And um, verse 31, And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which, are, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds. For their trade hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So Joseph's saying, he's looking out for him here, first of all. Now he knows, of course, they have a lot of flocks and, 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 and wealth in that sense. But he's telling them, you know what? You're gonna, you need to tell Pharaoh that you're shepherds. You need to tell Pharaoh that this is what you do and this is your occupation. The reason why he's saying that, and I don't think it's untruthful because they do do that. They do watch over their stuff. But he's making a point to say that because he's making sure that Israel and all of his family are going to be separate from the Egyptians. Because a shepherd, it says shepherds are an abomination unto the Egyptians. 
Which that in and of itself, I mean, just look at the symbolism there, what a shepherd is. You know, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. Egypt is always looked at in, in, symbolically as the world, as an evil place, as a wicked place, as a place that's you know, run by Satan is, is always what Egypt is referred to. It's no doubt, it's no surprise that a shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Because you look at the men of God, are all, you know, Jesus Christ himself is referred to as the great shepherd. David was a shepherd. You know, you look at these people who, who watch over the sheep, watch over the flock, and, and make sure nothing bad happens to them. It's a great job. It's a godly job, but, you know, it's an abomination unto the, unto the heathen, unto Egypt. It's an abomination. So he's saying, hey, tell them that, and you guys will have this land over here. You'll be segregated from the rest of Egypt. And I think it was his attempt to help them to remain pure, to, to you know, maintain their integrity, because they had to leave their land. Now they're going to be intermingled with the heathen, and I'm sure he didn't want that. Joseph was a godly man still. He was following God. He's saying, look, we need to be separate. We're going to come out and be separate from this heathen land. Now, they're going to stay there because they're going to need to be fed and everything else, but they're not going to be mixed in with, with the world. They're still going to be separate. So when he tells them that they are shepherds, they will have their own land in Goshen and say, go ahead and do your thing over there. And that was, I think, foresight and good foresight from Joseph to be able to do that. And they were able to thrive and maintain their, their, their culture and their, um, their religion of serving the Lord just, just without being so mingled in with the world. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for preserving your word. God, I know there's, there's times I don't always understand everything that, that is written in your words. And I pray that you would just open up my understanding on these things and, and help us all to learn, dear God, and to grow and to, and to just understand more about, about these, these little issues that come up that um, might be a little bit puzzling to us. And we just pray that, that you'd open up our understanding and, and according to your will and in your time, Lord, that um, you'd help us understand, but that we'd also not get shaken in our faith um, there's always a good answer for, for the things that, that we don't quite understand. And um, Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to have the right mentality and mindset and faith when it comes to all kinds of decisions in our life, that we would be confident in, in, our, in our walk with you, that we're serving you well, and that um, we know that, that if we're doing those things, that, that we don't have to worry about an economic collapse. We don't have to worry about not being able to afford our children or, or anything else for that matter, dear Lord, because we, we can be confident that, to know that you are with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.